because you think he's a nice person, because you might have had personal connection with that that individual, that doesn't mean that they didn't rape. I think that the other issue is that the media layer on this idea that, oh, you'd recognise a rapist if they came across him because he would have some personality flaw or he would seem to you to be an evil person. And that actually is a false dichotomy and it's a dangerous one. Frequently, rapists are perfectly charming. They may have had very pleasant dealings with you. They may come across as a friendly, a perhaps even honourable person. That doesn't mean, mean that they didn't commit the crime. Leaving us the detailed allegations and the denials in the case of Russell Brand. There is a, a rather a depressing familiarity about the whole thing, isn't there? Yes, absolutely. And it's amazing how quickly uh, people have come aligned to protect him. You know, the rape apologists seem to be out in force already. And so, of course, these wars are now happening across social media, as they very much did with Weinstein in 2017, when those allegations first came out. Romina, could you just remind us about your story from the point of view of just throwing a light on you know the wider the wider conversation your abuse by Harvey Weinstein who you worked for Absolutely. So I was 24 when I first started working for Harvey Weinstein, and that was in 1998. Um, and I'd only started working at the job in July, and indeed it was, of course, one of my first few jobs out of college. Uh, I then uh, came forward with allegations. I was attacked at the Venice Film Festival, which is only a few months after I started working for Weinstein. Uh, I came forward with those allegations. I was fortunate that the other assistant uh, believed in me, Zelda Perkins. So she and I resigned our jobs together. We then got embroiled in a pretty nasty negotiation for a non-disclosure agreement, an NDA. And so we were effectively, uh, due to the allegations, locked out of our work, not only with Miramax, with Weinstein, but actually blackballed from the film industry as a whole. And we went into a 20-year silence. Um, we were only came, uh, able to come forward with our story in 2017 when the New York Times broke our story. I was too terrified to speak out publicly at all in 2017. And it took me another couple of years until 2019 when I eventually came public with my story. So mm. a full 21 years after the original assault took place. So, I mean, I, I take it now, given your your story as you tell it there, Rowena, it was a very difficult decision to decide to speak out in the way that you did. Appalling, really. Um, I think that there are a number of factors. I think the fact that we were so crushed when we were young women, uh, the two of us were 24 and 25, and we were really, um, you, you know, Harvey obviously had huge resources at his disposal, uh, not only uh, top lawyers in London, um, you know, his personal lawyer that flew over from New York with him, but, you know, the resources really to keep us silent through those 20 years. We felt he had unfettered access to the police, to lawyers, to really a circle of corruption around him, his board members, his brothers, other uh, senior staff at Miramax really rallied around him. So I think there were, was very little that we felt we could do as young women who were 24 and 25. And then even 20 years later, um, I didn't feel that I, um, I, I feared I might not be believed. I worried about the impact with my family. So I think that that is all to say it is really difficult for women to come forward with these types of allegations, um, either at the time that they happen or even perhaps many years later uh, when they are older, when they are smarter, when they have better resources at, at their disposal, as I did then. It's still really hard to step into the spotlight with these types of allegations. Yes. I mean, Harvey Weinstein was was rich. He was powerful. He was feared in the in the film industry is it your impression do you think that that show business is more prone to that sort of thing more hierarchical uh, an area where people of power can 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 intimidate and keep down people who have no power than other other uh, as, other parts of industry and business yeah, absolutely. I do think with entertainment that there is the cult of the personality. And I think in particular with entertainment, it sort of happens twice over. So you've got the cult of personality both within the organisation, people that are actually working with Russell Brand, with Harvey Weinstein. So in the company itself, in the productions that they make, on the show that you work on, obviously you know this person, you work with him, and that person's often, of course, a big personality. They've had to be so to be a personality. But then the other difficulty with someone in the media space spotlight is then every Jack and Jill at home actually thinks they know them. They don't particularly, but because they spend a lot of time in the media spotlight because they're a public figure, um, they think that they can make pronouncements on their character and their personality. They feel like a friend. And that's a sort of, uh, I think that's a trap that having uh, the perpetrator being someone in the media spotlight, uh, it often feels like the general public knows that person well, when in fact you only know one aspect of their personality. 
Mm. And I want to say to those out there who are rape apologists, really, that um, because you think he's a nice person, because you might have had personal connection with that that individual, that doesn't mean that they didn't rape. I think that the other issue is that the media layer on this idea that, oh, you'd recognise a rapist if they came across him because he would have some personality flaw or he would seem to you to be an evil person. And that actually is a false dichotomy and it's a dangerous one. Frequently, rapists are perfectly charming. They may have had very pleasant dealings with you. They may come across as a friendly, a perhaps even honourable person. That doesn't mean, mean that they didn't commit the crime. Yeah, so that's your message to those who were the apologists for abusers and rapists. What would you say to the victims, Rowena, who may be going through exactly the sort of dilemma that you went through those years ago, having suffered abuse, having been raped, whatever the crime happens to have been, and can't bring themselves easily to to, to make their situation known? What do you say to them? Is there anything you can say? Mm. Well, I understand that several survivors have come forward already. And of course, that is a better situation than one solo voice. So I'm hoping that those who've been brave enough to already come forward are taking comfort that other women have come forward. So the consolidation of the stories, I think, of several stories together, I mean, is very powerful. Um, you know, in Harvey's case, it did take over 100 women's coming forward to bring the story to light and to be believed. And I think it's um, ridiculous that so many uh, survivors have to come forward in order to have uh, the story believed. But I think it's often the case that you have to have a un un unified collection of voices against one person. Mm -hmm. And for those who haven't yet had the courage to speak out, I hope that they will draw strength from the number of women that have come out now. I don't think by any means it's an easy thing to do. I think there are many reasons why people will keep silent. The wish for privacy, perhaps a sense of shame, uh, uncertainty about what will happen to their nearest and dearest family, colleagues and so on. Um, but I think that if anything, I hope the Me Too movement has achieved in the intervening six years since 2017, seven years now since 2017, I hope that we have created an environment that enables women or perhaps eases their that very difficult path and transition to speaking out against, certainly against a public figure, but also perhaps against uh, people who are still private figures. I hope that we have made it easier for women as a whole to speak out. Um, because I think speaking out is incredibly important for those women that still remain in silence, for the women that know they're the only person that would come out against a particular person. Mm. I think that this, this situation, if you like, repeating itself of several women coming out at the same time offers those particular women courage and conviction against one perpetrator. 